And the Super speaker super. is uh, Sapan Agarwal, is a postdoc here with Eli Yabanovich. And so with that, please welcome to his own home, Sapan. Right, thank you. So I see I want to talk about why tunnel fets don't work and how to fix them. <laughs> so the question is, what do I mean by they don't work? So to really understand that, we have to say, what do we want tunnel FETs to do? And so really, if you want to make a good tunnel FET, there's three metrics that we really need. The first is, of course, we want to lower the voltage. So we want it to be steeper. Instead of taking 60 millivolts to get a decade change in current, ideally we'd want a few millivolts. But getting a lower voltage is only one piece of the puzzle. We also need to get a large on-off ratio, otherwise we'll just get killed by the leakage current. And then the next thing we need to consider is that we still need to have a high current density or a high conductance density. So that is that it used to be at one, milli, at one volt, we'd want around a milliamp per micron. So that's just to make sure we keep a high speed. But now since we're operating at much lower voltage, we're interested in sort of the RC time. and We want to have at least one millisiemen per micron. And so now we can ask, where are current tunnel FETs? It's like, yeah, we've seen subspecial swings less than 60 millivolts per decade. We may have even seen higher current densities but now ask at what current density have we actually seen 60 millivolts per decade? And that's around a nanoamp per micron. So off by only six orders of magnitude. So the question becomes, why is that? And how can we actually get a steeper turn on at the higher currents? And so I can, that's what I want to try to address. And so to understand what's going on, we have to look at what are the two ways to get a sharp ton turn on. So the first is that you can control the thickness of the tunneling barrier. So what that means is that if you have this tunneling barrier and you apply some voltage on the gate, you'll increase the electric field and make it thinner barrier, and so you can get a higher current. The problem with this is that it really only works well at low current densities. And once the current gets higher, it becomes much harder to actually change the tunneling probability. And so then the alternative is, well, if you don't want to use a modulate the tunneling barrier thickness, perhaps we can try to use the other mechanism, and that is energy filtering. And so the idea is that here, when your conduction band and valence band don't overlap, there's no state to tunnel to, and so ideally you'd get a very sharp turn on. And now you apply a little bit of bias on the gate, pull the conduction band down, and all of a sudden you should have a, an overlap and get a huge amount of current. The problem, as we'll see, is that these band edges aren't very well defined, and there will actually be states under here that allow current to flow when it's supposed to be off. So now let's see, kind of go into a little more detail on the two mechanisms. So first I want to start with modulating the tunneling barrier with. And so unfortunately I would say all of the best tunnel fit results have relied on this. So when you actually see something steeper than 60 millivolts per decade. The problem is they're never going to be good enough in that we're never going to see a sharp turn on near a milliamp per micron. It's only going to be down at these low current densities around a nanoamp. So you can kind of see here, this is what the paper from Intel, where they have something slightly better than 60 down near a nanoamp. And you can see that this shape starts to roll off. And actually, this shape is more or less fundamental in that the steepness here, so how many millivolts per decade it takes, is proportional to 1 over the log of the tunneling probability. And so that means you're always going to have a trade-off that at the low current densities, it'll be steep. But as you try to get your tunneling probability and current high, it's going to roll off. And so anytime you try to optimize this, you're going to end up, you're just not going to be able to get it to work at the high current densities. And so sure, this is interesting. If you want to have a tiny improvement over current transistors and maybe in a small space where you're working at lower speeds, but if you really want to go for the gold and actually try to get something that's steep at a high current density, we can't use this mechanism. So that means that, all right, we can't use the tunneling barrier thickness modulation. So let's try to use the energy, energy filtering or density of state switching. So now again, what's the problem with that? Problem is, nominally, this device should be off. But what you can see is that there's a lot of states below this band edge, and so you actually have current flowing. And what we're going to end up seeing is the actual distribution of these states. So then naturally the question becomes, well, what, what is that distribution? And so the first, for a first guess, you could try to look at, okay, what's optical absorption in a semiconductor? That might give you some indication of what the band edge is, what the band tails are. So here, for instance, is optical absorption in silicon. And so if this were a perfect semiconductor, you would expect the absorption to abruptly drop to zero at the band edge. But instead, what you see 
is that the optical absorption sort of gradually falls off at some exponential rate. And it actually takes 23 million electron volts to get a decade change in absorption. And so the question becomes, why are we seeing this? And so the reason for that is that there's, so there's phonons and thermal vibrations. And they cause strains which are going to cause energy levels to shift up and down. And so that smears out the band edge. And so that, this is going to be difficult to engineer. I mean, there may be ways to. But the problem is, in experimental results, we've never even seen anything this good. We don't actually measure this type of a band edge in electrical measurements. So like, I'd be happy if we could even get here, but we're nowhere near there. So it's, again, why? What's going on here? And so one of the, one of the challenges is just that any time we try to make a tunnel FET, we want to make the tunneling probability high, and we end up doping it heavily. But if you dope it heavily, you end up forming a very gradual impurity band. I mean, think about it. You're norm you normally say your band gap's narrowing because of the impurities, and you've created a lot of states below it, below your band edge. And so you end up having exactly this. Instead of this ideal band edge, you end up with a very gradual band. And you can't expect that to be sharp, and it isn't. And so that's directly reflected in optical absorption on doped semiconductors. As you increase the doping, the slope goes to around 60 millivolts per decade and even worse. So what it means is that if you end up doping your TFET heavily, you just won't see a sharp band edge and it won't work. So now we can say, all right, so kind of an idea of what's going on from optical absorption. What are the electrical measurements telling us? So you can look at a tunneling diode, and if you look at the current divided by the voltage, or the conductance versus voltage, you can actually just plot it and just look at what is that slope. And that's going to be a pretty good indication of what sort of the band edge density of states and sort of the steepness of the tunneling turn on. And so if you go through the literature and look at a variety of different diodes, what you find is that the best diodes <coughs> only show a band edge steepness of around 90 to 100 millivolts per decade, and many are worse. So, for instance, this paper here is one of the best. It's an indium arsenide aluminum gallium to med heterojunction, and it's only 98 millivolts per decade. Alternatively, you could look at some gallium arsenide homojunctions, and you see that it's around 130, and as the doping increases, it starts to get worse. And same thing in a silicon germanium heterostructure. You start around 160, and it gets worse as you increase the doping. So, really, it's, it's not looking good, I would say, because we are... The density of states at the edges are not steep, and it's like in all the experimental results, there's not coming out sharp. So it's what's going on. So we know that there's a lot of issues that can actually cause these problems. So in addition to the band tails caused by heavy doping, a lot of times you're suffering from interface traps, mid-gap mid, mid -gap traps, and even poor electrostatic design. You could have leakage paths that basically prevent you from seeing the sharp regions. And another major issue is when you have spatial inhomogeneity. So that means is if you build a large device, you could either have thickness fluctuations, you could have, in, in, I guess, fluctuations at a heteros junction, kind of any, any sort of variation is going to start smearing out your turn-on. In, in addition to all these technological challenges, there's a lot of, there's even fundamental issues. So as we mentioned, if, there, if you have phonons, at, say at room temperature, it's going to cause inherent band tails, and those are going to be much more difficult to engineer. And besides that, you could even... If you have a sharp energy level or a sharp band edge, you're going to have actually quantum mechanical smearing when it couples to the contacts or the source and drain. And so that's also going to limit the turn on. So now that we have all of these problems, the question becomes, is there anything we can do about it? And how do we, can we actually get around some of this? So I think the first thing we need to do is really eliminate spatial inhomogeneity. So we have to make the devices very small. So, for instance, if you have a large device, you're going to have multiple thresholds, and these thresholds are going to add up and sort of give you a very smeared out turn on. And so, if you start with a very small device, you can at least eliminate all of the different thresholds from adding together. And granted, it won't, you may have some issues with reproducibility, but given how far away we are from having even a single good device, it would be great if we can see that. Then the next thing is, of course, since doping is causing so much of a problem, we need to eliminate it. So the key to that is that instead of using doping, we need to induce our carriers electrostatically. So use the gate work functions to bring in electrons and holes. So this is one proposed structure that we're working on, but there's other structures you can imagine. 
So the basic idea is that you have an N gate and a P gate. And so this N gate channel is going to induce electrons below it, and this P gate will induce holes below it. So that way your tunneling occurs vertically between the gates, but there's no actual doping in the channel. And so another alternative, perhaps more futuristic, is that you can, instead of trying to eliminate, instead of trying to make a dye very small, maybe you could use an atomically perfect material. And so now there's these new materials called layered chalcogenides. And so you're going, these are, they actually have atomic level flatness. And so if you, if you look into these, maybe perhaps we can actually eliminate some of that variation. And so you'll actually hear a lot more about this in the next talk. And so one more thing is, so far I've addressed a lot about the steepness and how to make it steeper. But another challenge is also keeping the current density up. And so I just want to mention one key engineering principle that you can use to help increase this current density. And that's just that you want to confine your carriers in the tunneling direction. So what happens is if you confine it in the tunneling direction, you're increasing your electron's velocity by that confinement energy. Since it has a higher velocity, it's going to give you higher current. In addition, when you squeeze your wave function into a narrow quantum well or a narrow quantum dot, you essentially force more of it to leak out. And because of that, you get a larger overlap between these wave functions. And when you do that, you can actually increase the conductance by about 10 to 100x. All right, so overall, kind of just to summarize, what have we learned? So the key thing is that so far, we haven't actually made a single steep device at high on current. And if we want to do that, we have to get beyond the thickness modulation and, re and rely on density of states max switching. The problem is, to do that, there's a lot of things we need to solve. In particular, we really need to eliminate all of that spatial inhomogeneity. So that means using small devices, eliminating doping from the junctions, and perhaps even looking into materials where we have better atomic control. So, thank you. And so, any questions? Uh, you mentioned about the phonons and its effect on the state inside the band gap. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any uh, experiment like uh, in the low temperature that there is no like, band, you know, such a state? If it's due to phonons, then in low temperature we shouldn't see that. I mean, so that's definitely true. So if you go back like optical absorption, as you lower the temperature, the edge gets steeper. So, I mean, this edge will become steeper as you lower the temperature. And you can actually even see the signature of the phonons here with each phonon energy. You can kind of see those curves. It seems like, you know, on all these things, when you have tunneling, you also have a supply function. That supply function is a Boltzmann factor, and then you always have uh, thermally assisted transitions, so you never get a sharp cutoff, um, both in absorption and... Um, so I, I don't see how you're ever going to defeat the KT limit. Um, and one way to tell is this is kind of building on the previous guy's comments is always measure the slope versus temperature now you will get a, a slope that's greater than kt right near when your current is changing sign and you do it on a log plot it's going through to negative infinity and it drops down and so you'll always see a very high slope right where your your current is yeah. about zero. So that's why you'll only see, uh, I, I would imagine, all these things that are reporting higher than KT slopes are probably seeing that factor. Um, but at any rate, I would always do a temperature dependence um, just to make sure, because I, I believe no matter how good you are, you, you'll, you'll see KT except for that changing polarity factor. So, that for the, so I'll address the second part first. So for the changing polarity. So I mean, in diodes, I mean, the key to, to, to eliminate that effect, if you plot the current divided by voltage, you eliminate that change in polarity. 
But in general, in tunnel fets, what happens is if you apply a voltage on the gate, your source drain bias is fixed. And so you don't actually have that change in polarity. It's just the gate, because the gate voltage is swinging. So those sub-60 tunnel fet results are definitely true, because that polarity change isn't there. I mean, so I agree. I mean, you have to be careful when analyzing your tunnel fat results. And some, some, some results can be questionable because of that. But when you go through it carefully, there are definitely results that don't have that issue. And I guess going back to the first question about the band edge. So I guess the way to think of it is that you have your supply function and you have your density of states. And so your current is going to end up being a product of the two of them. And so whichever one is sharper can end up cutting off the current. No, it's the other way around. If you have two exponentials to integrate over them, you always get the biggest one, not the smallest one. Yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, so I guess the best I can say is pectorally. I mean, because so, like, if you see here, you're, you, you never have, if, assuming this is a perfect band edge, you're never going to have electrons above it or below it. Yes, yeah, so you're, you're absolutely correct, but because it involves that phonon process, it's no longer 60. It's some sort of a mix of the two processes. And so you end up with this sort of, it's better than 60, but it's still not that great. Can I just ask my question? Sure. Yeah, follow up on his, his comment, I enjoy your presentations a lot, but I think the, uh, his comment exactly applies to your bilayer fat. So your, your, your supply limited, supply fluctuation limits your uh, slope. I'm, by layer, uh, I, I, by layer I, I, t I'm not sure why that would be particular to the bilayer. I mean, it's just a general issue that here you would still have your band edges based on the alignment between the N side and the P side. And and so your, like, your parasitics and your bilayer fat is very high. Oh, that's true. I mean, you have to carefully engineer the parasitics, and so... You have to consider, I mean, there will be leakage currents, and especially because we typically want to use a small band gap, and so you get higher parasitics. But I guess when you go through all of the numbers, it ends up working out that the parasitics are down around a nanoamp per micron. And if, so if we can do what our goal is, is to get our currents up near the milliamp, then it won't be an issue. I was just curious if you'd thought about reducing the phonons by some kind of design of the structure. So that's actually a very good question. And so we've looked at that a little bit, but it ends up being very challenging because for one is you have to then either control the phonon modes to some sort of phononic crystal, or one idea we looked at was, well, if we have these bandages jiggling up and down, perhaps we can cause them to move in the same direction with a given phonon. So this one goes up and this goes up, your effective band gap stays the same. And so we've looked at that a little bit, but it ends up being, it's quite difficult to engineer. And I think basically we have a lot more bigger issues before we even get there. Okay. Uh, can I have a last question? Quick, one quick. Yeah. Uh, the last remark of you to increase the current, you see the decrease the dimension, but when you decrease the dimension, uh, say if the perfect 2D, they even don't have the auto plan uh, a momentum, how you increase the energy to increase the uh, momentum for the uh, electron to turning out of your quantum well? So I guess so. there's two parts to the current flow. One is sort of like the current flowing into the board, like into the quantum well. And so that's going to more or less just be set by sort of a standard MOSFET electrostatics. And that's it. But that's still pretty high because it's, a, it's essentially a MOSFET. So now the question becomes you have this low tunneling probability in this direction, and you want to make up for that. Mm -hmm. And so to make up for that is where the quantum confinement helps. All right. We'll keep talking about it later. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you.